What do you do when every good thing of your life has been stripped from you and you're surrounded by hungry lions? You cry out for deliverance. This word deliverance, it's what I want to speak to you about today and what the Lord has put upon my heart. The word means the act of being rescued or set free. In other words, you don't deliver yourself. It's something that is done for you. The act of salvation, we were delivered from the penalty of sin. Every day after that, until we see Jesus face to face, we're being delivered from the pain of sin, the problems with it. We're all in need of deliverance of something here today. Some things the Lord put on my heart, things that may God deliver us from our pride. Fear, that spirit of fear, jealousy, anger, bitterness. May God deliver us from lust. Maybe you're suffering with depression and anxiety attacks. You need deliverance from those things today. Maybe it's demonic oppression you need deliverance from. So usually this word deliverance, the connotations are usually delivered from demons. And there's no doubt about in the Bible we see deliverance ministry is something that is connected with the demonic. Jesus had cast out demons. But I want you to know that deliverance ministry in the biblical sense has very little to do with demons. It has everything to do with us being delivered from us. Because see, that's what attracts demons is our flesh. That's what the snake was destined to feed off was the dust of the earth. You know, that stuff our flesh was made of. God's gonna have his way. Maybe you need deliverance from addiction, whether it's drugs, materialism, pornography. Maybe it's disease. We serve a God who forgives all of our sins and heals all of our diseases. Maybe you've been going to the same doctor for the last 12 years to find no relief, but you just need to grab a hold of him of his garment and be delivered from this life-draining trial you're going through. Maybe the worst thing, the most difficult thing and damning thing is you need to be delivered from lukewarmness. We need deliverance. It all is categorized in these three things, from the lies of the flesh, from the hatred of the world, because we do go through persecution from those that say they love God but do not. And of course, as spoken of, we need deliverance from the oppression of the enemy. Deliverance in Scripture, as mentioned before, is encapsulated primary in deliverance from the things of the flesh. Some biblical ideas of what deliverance is about is important for our foundation today. In the Psalms, if you do a word search in the Bible, you will see the word deliverance so many times in the book of Psalms. Psalms 37 says, the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble. And the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in him. Job said, deliver me from the enemy's hand. Redeem me from the hand of the oppressors. Now, some would say, I really don't need deliverance. I'm doing just fine. There is a great ignorance concerning what deliverance is, why it's there. The Apostle Paul says, 2 Corinthians, for we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure and above strength so that we despaired even life. Have you been there? Going through such difficult times, you're even suicidal. You just don't want to live anymore. 
The pain is beyond measure. You're just convinced God has given you more than you can handle. You know what the Bible says, but what you're feeling, what you're perceiving mentally and emotionally, you're going, I can't take it. I can't take this pain. I can't take this fear. I can't take the discouragement. I can't take any more rejection or abandonment. I, all I'm trying to do is love people, and I'm getting smacked in the face everywhere. I go, I can't take it anymore. He goes on to say, yes, we have the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves. Did you hear that? For anyone suffering with self-hatred because you're so disappointed in yourself, that's only because you trusted in yourself. Trials and difficulties are teaching us not to trust in us. That we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. It's almost like God, well, not almost, it is. God is the author and finisher of the difficulties, the pain, the trials, and the moment of deliverance. It's all him. He designs the whole thing. Job understood that. He said in chapter five of his testimony, he bruises, but he binds up. He wounds, but his hands make whole. Psalms 18, he brought me into a broad place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. You brought me into a broad, spacious place. There was great liability, and I was vulnerable, but you brought me there to show your power, God. Romans 7, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Say it out loud, church. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Whew, man. This is the Apostle Paul, someone who's been saved. The penalty of sin has been removed, but the pain and the problems thereof, he is under construction. Man, the things I don't want to do, these things I keep on doing, who is going to rest? Who's going to deliver me from this? The apostle Paul said, I need deliverance. From a demon? From his flesh. If you don't cry out for deliverance, then you will serve up filet mignon dinner to demons in your life. You will take on roommates you don't want in your life. And then you'll really need deliverance. Jesus himself, when answering the disciples, how shall we pray? And in Matthew, part of it's called the Lord's Prayer, but it's really the disciples' prayer, isn't it? He said, say this, deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. He says, you really need to be praying for deliverance, crying out. But here's the thing. Deliverance isn't necessarily what we think it is. If you go on YouTube and you type in deliverance, for the most part, what you're going to get is somebody barfing in a bucket. That's what you'll get. Now, I already premised my whole point on deliverance that dealing with demons is part of deliverance. It's just what the demons want the church to do is make it all about demons versus go to the root issue. The root issue is not demons. The root issue is you and me and our love for this world and listening to the members of our flesh, Romans 7, that are waging war against the members of our mind. So God designs a den full of lions, fire, storms, betrayals, and all these things that are hardships that take us a pain beyond measure and what we think we can handle, all to teach us that we need deliverance. If I can just go to the jugular to stop trusting in ourselves. The question is, when we cry out for deliverance, are we really crying out for deliverance or are we crying out for God to make life easy for us? Daniel 
prophesying the very day that Messiah would enter into Jerusalem in the triumphal entry. Matthew 21, it says, the multitudes went before those and followed. They cried out saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who came in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You've got millions of Jews crying out for deliverance. From what? Rome. Fix these problems that are messing with my bank account. Fix these problems that are shaving away the freedoms to do what I want to do with my life. And they're crying out for deliverance. But the thing is, God's the one who ordained that oppression all to teach them to stop trusting in what they think is right and start trusting in God. Deliverance. The Apostle Paul prayed for deliverance. In 2 Corinthians 12, from a thorn in the flesh, the message of Satan sent to buffet him to keep him from becoming prideful. God said, my grace is sufficient. I'm gonna let you have this weakness and my deliverance is not removing the thorn in the flesh, but teaching you something really important that my strength is made perfect in your weakness. That was the deliverance that Paul received when he prayed. What was he praying for? He was praying for deliverance from something else. He was praying for deliverance from this physical ailment, this problem. Not that we shouldn't ask for that because God heals, amen? God does. It's just, whenever we pray for deliverance, we have to remember he's God and we're not. And however he chooses to answer our heart's cry, we've learning to trust him, you see. How long does that take? Your whole life. The disciples in the Roman Colosseum that cried out for deliverance as they were thrown to the lions, did they receive deliverance? Yes. We're all going to die sometime, some way. And once when we get to heaven, we won't really care how it happened. I promise. God knows best. He's delivering us from us by any means necessary. And those means would not be means that you and I would choose. God is teaching us. And he's drawing us close to himself because as the scripture says, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart are loyal to him. God is searching for hearts that are loyal to him, you see. And you really don't know how loyal you are until everything is stripped away from you and how you respond at that moment. It's a revelation that comes through pain and difficulty. Daniel, our partner in faith, a man of God. It occurred to me that Daniel was not known as a prophet. Elijah was known as a prophet. Isaiah was known as a prophet. Hosea was known as a prophet. Daniel was known as a politician. He prophesied, but he was a politician his whole life, as we'll read today. And if you'll believe this, he was an honest politician. Unicorns do exist. <laughs> and we see this honest politician used for the glory of God in the midst of the darkest place on planet Earth bring glory to God as God strips him of everything. We pick up in our story today of deliverance where Daniel is going on 90 years old and is about to be used in mighty ways. So for those of you here with gray hair on Geritol and a king, don't you think God can't use you in mighty ways? Amen? As long as you got a pulse, God can work mighty miracles in and through your life. So Daniel here, of course, he's been through so much at the age of 15, taken away from Israel castrated as a teenager, turned into a slave in Babylon, 
lives his whole life and goes through all kinds of incredible trials and challenges and honors God through them all. We know from reading our last study in the book of Daniel that we watched the Medo-Persian Empire come and overtake Babylon. Daniel, in his mid-80s at the point, had been forgotten by the recent king, and he came in and read the writing on the wall. Now Darius, Darius, and as well as Cyrus, the general who orchestrated the whole overtaking of the Babylonian camp, where they held back the water from the Euphrates River, and they were able to kind of just walk in on dry land right under the city walls. Now Darius is impressed and pleased with Daniel. Daniel's got a new calling. Once again, he's a politician. As we'll read, he is a president of sorts. Darius, what he did, first order is he appointed 120 governors and three presidents to oversee the whole empire. Those three presidents were the ones that held those 120 governors accountable, and Daniel was the head of the three presidents. In other words, if the other two presidents wanted to somehow cook the books a little bit, shortchange Darius on some of the money, they had to be accountable to Daniel. In other words, Daniel would catch him doing it. Now you can imagine what kind of problems that caused for Daniel. Because these other two guys, as we'll read, were crooked as could be. Daniel, a godly, honoring, truthful politician with integrity. And you need to know, guys, whenever, as the scripture says in 2 Timothy, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ will suffer persecution. Whenever you're going to live for Jesus, you are going to attract problems in your life. The more that you walk like Jesus, the more people will hate you and want to kill you for his name's sake. This is what, where we find ourselves in Daniel chapter 6, where it says, verse 1, it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps, the governors, to be over the whole kingdom. And over these, three governors, of whom Daniel was one. And the satraps might give account to them, so the king would suffer no loss. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps, because an excellent spirit was in him. And the kingdom, the king gave thought to set, setting him over the whole realm. So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful. Now understand, this doesn't mean that Daniel was without sin. There was only three people in the Bible without sin. That was Adam and Eve, and they changed that, didn't they? And then, of course, our Lord and Savior, the Jesus Christ, who lived his whole life without sin. So it doesn't mean without sin. It just means he lived. In other words, there was nothing, there was no skeletons in his closet. There was nothing being hidden. We've read where Daniel's confessed his sin in previous chapters, the sins of the whole nation, but he was always up to date on his confession and right before God with his life. There was nothing hidden in his life. He was an open book before God and all of mankind. What a way to live, amen? And these guys are going nuts, going, we, we gotta find something, some picture, let's find some pictures of Daniel with one of the prostitutes or something. There's just nothing there. Right? I tell you, there's so much more peace in your life when you live a life that's just an openness before God. Hiding nothing. There's no sin up under your tent with causing your life to be aching, right? It just, you're just, you're free from that. That was Daniel. This is driving these guys nuts. It says, nor was there any error, error or fault found in him. Then these men said, we shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. So, we're trying to get, find some way to remove Daniel. So what we're going to do is we're going to somehow use his relationship with God against him to remove him. Now they're fixing to cook all types of lies, twist and manipulate Darius the king in a way to somehow turn it against Daniel, who this king really likes Daniel. How could you not, right? What a great guy. What a great old man. A big teddy bear for God. He's awesome. But he's a problem. And I want you to know that God ordains us to be put in situations where we really haven't done anything wrong. 
We've been honest, we've been loving, we've been charitable, we've been gracious, and all of a sudden we're being accused of doing something really that we didn't do. And I want you to know that there's a reason why God ordains us to be put in these situations. Because like I said, Daniel, though he couldn't find any fault with his accounting, with his integrity, the way he treated people, his honoring of the king and doing the right job, he did an excellent job. There's always something God is refining inside. It's kind of like Job, right? It looked like Job was this perfect guy, but you read further down in the story and all these trials and hardships, all of a sudden this self-righteousness started to come out inside of Job, right? There's always something we need to be delivered from, but that's really not the only reason God takes us through it. Listen, God takes us through horrific times because he's going to shine his glory through us. How many times have you been delivered from something all to give God the glory and someone is blown away at what God did? It might have been an addiction. It might have been a problem in your marriage. It might have been a healing with a disease. But when that happens, I don't care if it took a year or 12 years or 20 years, when it's done and you speak that testimony, there is anointing and there is power in that. Do you hear what I'm saying? It's one thing to read about a testimony, but when you walk that road of suffering, that difficulty, and you trust in the Lord your God and all the heathen are watching, that's when you can give glory to God. And that's exactly what we read. And what we're going to do is read through the rest of this story, and I'm going to come back and I'm going to share with you what I see, one key verse in this passage that God spoke to my heart when I asked him, so Lord, how... When we go through horrific, terrible times, how do we experience deliverance? And we're going to read through this story. I'm going to share a few things with you, which I believe that if you'll drink this in, it'll change your life. I don't know about you, but I like my life getting changed. Amen? Amen. Hey, let's take a look at the rest of the story, looking at verse 6. It says, So the governors and the satraps thronged before the king and said thus to him, King Darius, live forever. They're suck-ups, clearly. All the governors of the kingdom and the administrators and satraps, the counselors and the advisors have consulted together to establish royal statute and to make a firm decree. Now, not everybody was consulted because we know Daniel was not. The top out of the three presidents was left out of the loop here, Right? It says that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days, except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not alter. Therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. So Darius, we'll read, he wasn't exactly the sharpest tool in the shed. Okay, Cyrus was, was really the mastermind behind um, overtaking Babylon. He's the one after a couple of years that comes in and he becomes king. And he's the one as prophesied to almost 200 years earlier, would be the one who set free the nation of Israel to go back to their homeland. So I, it seems like while Cyrus was the mastermind, he wasn't power hungry because he just kind of like, stayed in the background until Darius was removed. But Darius, while he was a, seemed to be a pretty decent guy and, and had good taste in, in who he wanted as a president, he was easily manipulated. And that's exactly what we're just watching happen. So he signs this decree, not seeing through what they're trying to do. It says, now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home. And in his upper room, with his windows open towards Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks to God, as was his custom since early days. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before God. And they went before the king and spoke concerning the king's decree. Have you not signed a decree that every man who petitions any god or man within 30 days except you, O king, O king, shall be cast in the den of lions? And the king answered and said, This thing is true, according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not alter. So they answered and said before the king that Daniel who is the one of the captives from Judah, does not show due regard for you, O king, or for the decrees that you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. And the king, when he heard these words, was greatly displeased with himself. 
And he set his heart on Daniel to deliver him and the labor till going down of the sun to deliver. Now understand, so Darius is not pleased what's going on. He's trying, he's, he's going to play lawyer all day and try and find a loophole knowing he can't change the law because according to the law, there's no hope for Daniel. Kind of like you and I prior to knowing Christ, right? There was no hope for us under the law. So man is trying to save Daniel and deliver him. It says, then these men approached the king and said, King, know, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and the Persians, that no decree or statue which the king established may be changed. So the king gave the command, and they brought Daniel to cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. And then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring, with the signets of his lords, that the purpose of the concerning Daniel might not be changed. Now, when, when, I'm, I wondered about this, where Darius is saying, hey, your God is going to save you. Is that a declaration, or is it like optimizing, and I'm hoping? I think it's the latter, because if his faith was really in God to save Daniel, he wouldn't have been so busy trying to do it himself. So it's probably, probably just more like I'm hoping things work out for Daniel because your God's going to have to do something because I can't do anything. So we'll see what happens. So somewhat of a prophecy there, as if you know the story. It goes on to say, Now the king went in his palace and spent the night fasting, and no musicians were brought before him. Also his sleep went from him. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went out in the haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. The king spoke saying, Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to deliver you from the lions? Just stop right there. You know, if it was me, if I was Daniel, I would just be quiet for a few minutes. <laughs> I, I just make him wait, you know. And so, of course, Daniel's going to tell him that, hey, Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God has sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. Now the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury whatever was found on him because he believed in his God. And the king gave the command and they brought those men who had accused Daniel and they cast them into the lion's den, them their children, and their wives. And the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces before they came to the bottom of the den. Now understand, that was not necessarily God's command, but it was Persian law when there was a false accusation that those who committed the false accusation, they paid the price of those who were being accused. So Darius was actually upholding Persian law with what took place here. Talk about, I, I, we know it wasn't their wife's fault, their children's fault, but I tell you what, when we sin, it affects our family, doesn't it? When we choose to rebel against the ways of God, those that we care for and provide for and oversee, they pay a price. It says, King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell on the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble in fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one who shall not be destroyed and his dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and he rescues. And he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth, who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. In our deliverance, Christian, we bring glory to God. God only allows us to go into a situation where there is no hope for man to deliver us. 
He allows us to go in a situation which is completely hopeless, and then God gives hope. The apostle Paul alluded to that in Corinthians where he said, hey, I've learned that when I'm weak, then it's really his strength. I have nothing to offer God. This is a powerful passage, family, but there's one verse that jumped out to me through this whole idea of that God orchestrates and designs every part of our life. I know some of you go, but Dave, I'm not so godly like Daniel, and the trials I need deliverance from are not just because people are lying to me or the enemy is oppressing me, it's because of me indulging in the flesh. So how, maybe this doesn't apply to me because I'm not as righteous as Daniel. I got news for you. Whether it is the lies of your flesh and the indulgence thereof or the oppression of oppressors and liars around you, persecuting you, or the demons that come to feed off both of those, we are all in need of deliverance. And this incredible verse that Daniel models for us will address whatever deliverance you need. And if you're humble enough to admit it, you need deliverance today. You're being weighted down. You're not giving the glory to God as you could be if you walked and trusted in your God like Daniel did. The key verse in our passage today, look with me at chapter 6, verse 10. It says, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed. In other words, man, everything is falling apart. I know what this is about. Daniel was a smart guy. What did he do? It says he went home in his upper room with his windows open towards Jerusalem, and he knelt down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since early days. Do you want to experience deliverance? The first thing I want you to write down is pray in the upper room. What's the upper room? The upper room, well, it's a lot different than what Darius. Darius was going, I've got to figure a way out to solve this problem. Not Daniel. Daniel. You don't see Daniel doing the political hopscotch or walking around. I need to talk to people. I got to get people to help me. He's like, no, I need to go to God. I'm going straight to God because he's the only one. Man can't change this. Only God can change this. So he goes to a place where he isolates himself from everybody but God. He's seeking first the kingdom. Man, when you're suffering with this, this unholy roller coaster ride of a walk with Jesus, you know what I'm talking about, right? So much where you're so tired of asking God to forgive you because in your heart of hearts, you're going, I'm just going to do it again. Matter of fact, I feel embarrassed to even go to God. So instead, I'll go to a counselor, I'll go to a program, I'll get on medication. God uses all of those things, but if you make them God, you will not find deliverance. God has to be first. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Whatever you're needing, man, deliverance from, God is able to deliver you. Psalm 34, the righteous cry out, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of, come on, all of their troubles. When the disciples were, their lives were being threatened, where did they go? We need to go to the upper room. We're not gonna, we're not gonna make an appointment with Caiaphas. We're not gonna get a lawyer. We're, we need to go to God. Only God can fix this. What does it take for us to get to the point where we stop part-timing and putting our hope in God? Daniel, I mean, and something else I took note of with Daniel, the man with the excellent spirit, it says that he went to pray as was his custom since early days. In other words, he wasn't one of those 911 prayer warriors. It was just a way of life. In other words, he was constantly going before God. I just need my time with God, I need to seek his face because I've learned whatever can be, can be changed by man, God can change it. It's in this place of hopelessness that God will deliver me. This is the perfect setting for God to show up and do something amazing. So I'm going to go spend time with him. How much time do you spend with him? Never put God on a clock. You just go sit and you wait. As the Ecclesiastes says, don't be in a hurry to leave the presence of the king. 
you just go sit and you wait. Prayer is not just talking to God, it's listening to God. Daniel listened to God. I need to know what the, the, the dream Nebuchadnezzar had some 70 years ago. I need to know what it is. That wasn't talking to God, that was listening to God. So when you get in that upper room, you're going, Lord, I, I, I need to pour my heart out to you. I need to cry out. And then I need to be still and just listen to you. And again, don't put God on a timer. Don't wait to go, well, as long as I'm, if I, if I get bored, I'll stop. You're just going to sit and you're going to wait because you're here in this place. You've turned the phone off. The computer's not on. You found a place of solitude where no one's going to come and interrupt you. It's sacred. It's holy ground. You're just, I'm here for you, God. If you don't start there, then you'll try and deliver yourself with human means. And you'll spiritualize it. We all do. But you'll get really frustrated. The second thing we see that Daniel does, not only does he pray in the upper room, the second thing it says that he prayed in remembrance. Remembrance of what it says that he opened the window. He went into his upper room and he opened the window. Daniel's window faced Jerusalem. Now, why would he do that? Why would in his prayer, why would he face Jerusalem where there used to be a temple? Because Daniel prayed according to Scripture. If you want deliverance, you want to pray according to Scripture. Not what you think, but what God says. Amen? And Daniel knew the word in 1 Kings, at the dedication of the temple, it says, when your people Israel are defeated by an enemy because they have sinned against you, and when they turn back to you and confess your name and pray and make supplication to you in this temple, then hear in heaven and forgive the sin of your people Israel and bring them back to the land which you have gave to their fathers. When the heavens are shut up and there is no rain because they have sinned against you, when they pray towards this place. Do you hear that? When they pray, in other words, when your people have been taken into exile and they've been removed, have them pray towards this place. What was this place? The temple. The temple. What was so significant about entering the temple? It was all about sacrifice. It was all about atonement, you see. Let me keep reading here. He goes on to say, you afflict them them here in heaven and forgive their sin of your servants, your people Israel, that you may teach them the good way in which they should walk and send rain on your land which you have given to them and your people as an inheritance. In other words, what's going on is Daniel saying, I'm going I'm to seek first God and I'm going to look towards God's temple. I'm going to remember the sacrifice and the atonement because that's the only way I can inquire. The one thing I desire to inquire in the temple of God, I have to look towards the sacrifice. You understand? The one thing, the one thing that brings deliverance, listen, family, it's the blood. Say it out loud. It's the blood. That's what brings deliverance. What caused the death angel to pass over the people of God in Israel? The blood. What does the scripture say as you read in Revelation chapter 12? It says clearly that the accuser of our brethren who accused them before God day and night has been cast down and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony and they did not love their lives unto death. Do you hear this? The key for deliverance when the enemy is oppressing you is the blood of Christ. That's the only thing that restores us to right fellowship with God. Whether it's positionally getting saved or it's practically acknowledged, this is what causes the enemy to flee. It's the righteousness of God that covers me. Daniel wasn't about loving his own life. He's not trying to manipulate. He's not trying to play a politician or the lawyer. He's not trying to change Darius' mind. He's like, you know what? It's what the law is. I knew that when I prayed. Can you imagine having more politicians that care more about what God thinks than what people think? Can you imagine more Christians that care more about what God thinks than what man thinks? What a model. And this man of God, this man of excellent spirit, is someone who says, I seek God first. And whenever I seek God, I look towards his holy temple because it's only through the sacrifice I can enter into that most holy place of communion with God. 
I have to look towards atonement. The third thing that we see that Daniel does, it says he gets on his knees. He prays on his knees. Do you ever get on your knees and pray? Position in prayer is everything, man. It's Solomon, if you read on that chapter, Solomon, this king gets on his knees and humbles himself. Elijah prayed on his knees. Paul prayed on his knees. Jesus, modeling for us, got down on his knees and he prayed. There's this position of humility. When someone gets on their knees, you're basically saying, there's nothing that I can do. I'm putting my hope in you. If you want deliverance, then you're basically saying, there's nothing I can do here. This is not a partnership. Deliverance is not a partnership. It's completely God who does it. As someone who's coming from a $200 a day cocaine addiction, I didn't deliver me. I didn't give, I don't put my hope in a program or a pill. I put my hope in a person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only one who gets the glory. And when I talk to a drug addict, I say, God can deliver you. And you know what? There's power in my testimony. You know why? Because I've been delivered. What have you been delivered from? Because there's power and there's anointing in that. And it's not of you, it's of God, you see. And when you declare that to the nations, even Darius is going, everyone's gonna know that God delivers and saves. Daniel's God. There is no other God that can do this. What a privileged position to be in that place to declare and herald that. But that, see, that's preceded by a lion's den. It's preceded by a loss of your rights, a loss of hope, depression, pain, hopelessness always precedes real, true, living hope, you see. I wish it wasn't that way, but that's the way God designed it. And it's awesome. God is so smart, amen? He, he knows things we don't know. And he sees things that we don't see. That's exactly what was going on with Daniel. So Daniel's getting on his knees and he's humbling himself. That's so important, guys. After you seek first God and put your, all your hope and trust in him, after you're going, Lord, it's only because of the cross of Calvary. It's only because of the atonement. That is only because of the altar of God that I can approach God. It's at that key place that you humble yourself. It's all too often that we find some relief from spending time with God, thanking God for the cross, and we find some relief, and then we get back into trusting ourselves. It's like getting healed, and you start to feel better, and then you overdo it and get sick again. You have to continue to maintain a countenance and a position of humility, and that's a choice to humble yourself. Getting on your knees doesn't make you humble. But I tell you what, it sure is an offering to God, isn't it? Kind of like when you lift your hands to God. Lifting your hands to God does not give you a surrendered heart, but it is an act of a request of a prayer and saying, God, I'm surrendering my heart to you. I'm getting on my knees and praying because I'm saying, there's nowhere I can go. There's nothing I can do to fix this. I'm not going to go try and talk my way out of this. Only you can fix this. And that takes this, this thing that's really hard to walk in. It's called humility, right? I mean, are there any humble people in the room? <laughs> One of those questions is hard to answer, right? Yes, I'm very humble and I take great pride in it. Yes, I do, right? It's, it's like, yeah, yeah. But, but Peter, I love this passage about humility. In 1 Peter 5, it says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world, but may the God of grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered for a while, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. This was the apostle Paul, who uh, Peter, I should say, who was just about to get crucified upside down. This is after watching his wife be crucified. I have no diet, doubt that he's praying, God, deliver my wife from this agony and this pain. And you know what? God did. Peter, he's like, no, God, if this is what you're calling me to go through, I'm going to bring you glory in this suffering. We pray for deliverance from the suffering because like Daniel, 
we might not be touched by the suffering in the lion, right? I personally prefer that outcome. How about you? But I'm not God. You're not God. God knows things we don't, so we pray and we cry out, but then ultimately we trust him. Daniel was ready to be dinner. Do you hear that? Because he goes, this, this is not who I am. If, I, if, I, if I'm going to be a Stephen and glorify God being stoned to death, I'm going to be a Peter being crucified, or will I be an Apostle John and die in my old age? Seeing that we don't have any control over it, why not just surrender it to God? Why not just go, God, I'm going to humble myself and confess that you're the one who knows everything, and I'm just going to humble myself. What does that mean? That means, God, you ready? I trust you. I trust you, and I'm not going to try and tell you your job. I'm not going to be one of those people that are crying out Hosanna, but really, I'm just trying to use you, God, and manipulate you like these presidents manipulated Darius. And many times, prayers of deliverance are nothing more than a means of manipulation to God. I got news for you, it won't work. You can't manipulate God. God can't have a design, a blueprint. This is what I'm going to take Paul through. See, he's going to be shipwrecked. He's, he's going to go through this. But, but he can always ask me and change my mind. But you go, but David, what about the suffering that's a result not of persecution of the enemy or hatred of the world and me living a righteous life, but just of my own rebellion and sinfulness? Hey, God is going to be glorified in that too. I mentioned to you my drug addiction. Whatever addiction you have, whatever bitterness you have, I cannot tell you the bitter roots I have struggled with in my life that have brought all types of, you ready, physical problems. When you read in the book of James, man, there's a lot of sickness, I think, that goes on that's a result of bitterness and hidden sin. Not always. I mentioned Paul with his thorn in the flesh and problems. That wasn't a result of sin that he had, but to keep from, be, from becoming prideful, right? But there's, there's things in our life where we're dealing with all types of problems, anxiety attacks, because there's hidden sin, there's hidden bitterness, there's things that are going on where God's saying, just humble yourself, right? It, it's so much better to do that. Just to say, God, I'm going to be steadfast in my faith. I'm going to acknowledge it's the blood. It's the gospel. It's not me trying to fix it myself. I can't make myself right with you. I couldn't do it. I still can't. I never will, Lord. It's all you. It's so liberating to not be God, isn't it? Just to go, I, I, there's nothing I can do here, Lord. It's all you. Humbling yourself and check it out. Just because you did it yesterday doesn't mean you, you're good today. Do you need to humble yourself? Let's take a test. Is there anybody in your life that you think you're better than them? There you go, right? There is, just in case you don't know that, in case you're too prideful to admit it. There's someone you think that you're better. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. The fourth thing it says that Daniel prayed three times a day. The fourth thing I want you to write down is if you want to be delivered, pray incessantly. Why did he pray three times a day or incessantly, constantly, without ceasing? The scripture says amongst many areas, I will call upon God, Psalms 55, and the Lord shall save me. Evening and morning and at noon, I will pray and cry aloud. He shall hear my voice. He has redeemed my soul in peace from the battle that was against me, for there were many against me. Daniel was a man, as it says, he went into prayer, as was his custom in the early days. Let me tell you what, when you're going into a need for deliverance, it's a good thing to have a background that you're already a man or a woman of prayer. If you create a pattern of prayer where, you, like Paul said, pray without ceasing, you're just constantly talking to God. And communicating to God is not just as I talked about, speaking, but listening. And when you have that type of action in life, you're listening to God, you walk with a perspective that is heavenly. And you don't shrink back in fear, loving your own life. When Jesus came out of the mountain of transfiguration, they dealt with some demonic activity and had difficulty. He said in Matthew 17, he said, this kind doesn't come out by prayer and fasting. Do you know that when you're dealing, have a need for deliverance, you can't go, 
hold on, let me go fast. Hold on, let me go be a person of prayer. A little late. Difficulties and trials and lion dens are going to come our way. And if we're like Daniel, that we are a person of prayer, okay? We get up in the morning, fill me, Holy Spirit. I can't do anything without you today. Lunchtime, I value the words of your mouth more than my daily bread, Job said. I just want to spend some time with you. Before I eat my dinner, Lord, I'm trusting in you to fill me. Can you imagine all day long being someone that just talks with God? This coming Friday, I'm going to be meeting with 12 to 14 guys for a 12-week leadership training course. And this is going to be, for those of you that are going to be part of that, know this is going to be part of your exercise, daily appointments with God in prayer. Because without them, you can't walk in faith. You can't walk with a perspective to trust God in the midst of things not going the way you think they should go. You have to constantly maintain this connection with God because if you don't maintain it, it's like that muscle that used to look so cut and now it's flabby. You've got to maintain that, that faith muscle in prayer. And, and it's like, how many times does a person work out and they do a repetition? They do this. Are you going, I just can't wait to do this repetition? You're not. You're going, I don't want to do this but I want to be able to see my feet when I look down, so I'm going, to, I'm going to do this. Each one I'm doing, I can't stand it, but then after a while, it starts to feel like some energy with it, right? Consider that prayer is something like that. You might start off praying. It might, the heavens might not be open, okay? You might be saying the right things, but you're not sensing his presence. That's a test. That's a test. Are you going to walk by faith or by feelings? Just commit those daily devotions, those dates with God. Have a date with God in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening. It's not meaning you just pray three times a day. It's just meaning throughout the day you're constantly thinking about God and his kingdom and his voice and his plan and what pleases him and what grieves him and what quenches the Holy Spirit. And you're constantly thinking about that. And then when all of a sudden the rug gets pulled out from under you, you lose your job, your spouse cheats on you, the dog pees on the carpet, the hot water heater breaks, whatever it is, right? You just go, God, you got this. You've got the joy of the Lord. Why? Because you're a man, you're a woman of prayer. You pray incessantly. You're always talking with God and listening to God because his voice means more to you than anything else. The last thing that we see Daniel does in this passage is he's the prayed in thanksgiving. Do you ever pray in thanksgiving when your whole world is falling apart? It sounds like someone needs mental help to pray such a thing, doesn't it? I mean, why would you pray? You used to be like the president of Persia over the whole empire just under the king, and now you're food for lions. Talk about a change in job description and existence, and you're praying in thanksgiving? Are you kidding me? It made me think of this first and second Thessalonians where it says, rejoice always. Read this out loud with me, church. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing in everything. Give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Wow. Thank God when I'm shipwrecked. Thank God for everything I'm going through because I believe that he's sovereign and he wastes nothing and he's using everything to give himself glory through me because a real servant of the Lord lives to bring the Lord glory, you see. See, the thing is, Daniel knew God was going to deliver him. From the lion's mouth, that's not the point. God's going to deliver him. God has a plan. See, Daniel had lived his whole life with this closing passage I'm going to read. We are actually going to close today. It's going to happen, I promise. <laughs> there was a prophecy by a prophet by the name of Jeremiah. And since Daniel was a young child, he knew of this prophecy. That the people of God would be taken into captivity, but after 70 years they would be delivered. Daniel also knew of the prophecy about Cyrus 
I can't even imagine what that was like, Daniel having a conversation with Cyrus as he becomes king and talks about in the book of Isaiah where a bird of prey, and uh, basically an icon, a picture that was on Cyrus's banner, a bird of prey, and then all of a sudden Cyrus's name, both of these things almost 200 years ago, and you're going to be the guy to free God's people after 70 years. Can you imagine that conversation? <laughs> He knew, Daniel knew God was going to deliver. He knew this passage in Jeremiah where the scripture says, for thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit and perform my good word towards you and cause you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you from the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I cause you to be carried away away captive. Powerful. Daniel's like, God, you promised. You said you would deliver your people, and I trust you, God. I have peace in the midst of this pain, this problem. Last verse. I know I said that was a closing verse. Forgive my deceit. Last verse, the real one. Psalms 34. Say it out loud, church. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Hallelujah. What are you in need of God delivering you from? Whatever it is, I promise you, if you'll go seek his face, go in your upper room, look towards the atonement, the blood of Christ that gives you access to a holy God. You understand? Humble yourself before the Lord. Pray without ceasing. Press in. Don't give up. Hold on to the hem of his garment, not letting go until you are delivered. And until that happens, thank him like it already did. And I promise you, whether the problem that, that's earthly goes away or not, you at that moment will be delivered. In Jesus' name. <laughs>